I'd like to introduce, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, Matthew Chewy Truella. Some of you may have met him before or seen him on his travels around the UK, speaking to clients and with agencies. Uh, a one-time customer solutions engineer working for us. Um, he's now working our business development team at Google UK. Um, he's a long-serving Googler with a, a deep technical sort of appreciation for all of our products and how those products can work with our with advertisers and our agencies. Also a keen video games player. I think he spends far too long late at night um, playing games. Uh, his, his particularly, if you've got any kind of interest, his particular game of choice at the moment, I think, is Zelda. So um, we haven't got times afterwards for questions, but I think that we should uh, have Chewy outside for um, coffees later on and also perhaps later on this evening. Please welcome Chewy to the stage. Thanks very much. <laughs> Good to see Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this mic OK? They were worried about the fact that I'm not wearing a shirt. Um, so let me bring up the presentation. How's that looking? Um, OK, so I'm going to give you, uh, it's, uh, it's called a live product update. I'm actually going to talk about some of the older products and some of the newer products, because I think that um, there's a lot of stuff we've got that isn't really being taken advantage of. Um, and you guys can take advantage of it, too. Um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about innovation. Um, Google's easy, and I think that's the reason it's become a success. Uh, I was probably introduced to Google a couple of years after it launched. A friend said, hey, you can search for code on this site, and it actually returns good results. And we started using it to answer some of our uh, problems. But my mum, I think, started using it because it's a box with a button, and it's really straightforward. Back in the day when you had Excite and Lycos and AltaVista and all those other websites, you had a crazy front page, and the results were interspersed with ads, and it wasn't clear you know, what was spam and what wasn't, and it was kind of hard to find relevant results. Um, Having a box and two buttons makes it a lot easier. My mum still struggles to understand what the second button does, um, <laughs> interestingly. Um, I tell her to click it and see what it does, and she's like, no, it might break it, I'm scared. <laughs> um, but it's important to realize that whatever's happening you know, to the user, keeping that as simple as possible, it's okay to make it really, really complicated behind the scenes. We've got a lot of really smart engineers spending a lot of their time trying to get the best results possible to our users, but we want to maintain a nice, clean, simple to understand interface. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that it's okay to take baby steps. Um, Facebook wasn't around four years ago. YouTube wasn't really around five years ago. But um, I remember one of our senior directors doing a presentation and saying, what did we do before YouTube uh, when we did presentations? And it's true. You know, you watch a lot of these videos, a lot of, a lot of these presentations, there's videos involved. And the idea of being able to access content or video content on the web is almost second nature to us. We can't imagine a time that it wouldn't be possible. I suggest going to Africa, you really struggle, but um, yeah, they've got some interesting challenges. But the point is, um, baby steps are, are okay to take. Launch something, see how it works, see what's received, see how users interact with the different features, and then look at your data to refine what works, to remove the uh, parts that don't work. Google's kind of famous for launching products in beta. Um, we've got a habit of launching stuff. It doesn't mean that we think it's going to break. What it means is we're not sure that we've got all the features right yet. Um, and we'd like to put it out to users and get real data feedback. And sometimes that's through surveys, but actually much more interestingly, it's through looking at how users interact with websites. Um, there's a cool website, well, it's, it's cool if you like data, um, called uh, Get Clicky. They have an analytics package, much like Google Analytics. Um, and what they do is uh, provide a bunch of breakout reports. I'm going to try and uh, go Get Clicky here. If you just search for Get Clicky browser stats, you'll get to this uh, website. And what they do is show you the kind of browser share of different browsers. And this top one's Internet Explorer. And the dips are the weekend, which always amuses me. So when people go home and use their own computers, they stop using Internet Explorer for whatever reason. Um, but more interestingly, there are some cool breakout reports uh, that they generate uh, from time to time. One of the most interesting is the Apple iPad. Um, if it loads. Uh, there we go. So the orange line is the iPad. The green line is the iPod Touch. And it's interesting to me that really until August, the number of users accessing the internet through the iPod Touch was the same as the number of users access, accessing through iPad. But without looking at this data, you wouldn't know. And especially given the furore around building new content for the iPad, you know, people maybe lost sight of the fact that there are still a lot of people accessing through the Touch and, in fact, the iPhone and other mobile phones. So always rely on your data to give yourself the full picture. Um, where are we here? Sorry, presently on a Mac. I don't know the shortcut keys. But, um, there's, Google has some products as well which can help you optimize how uh, your website can work. Um, the first is Analytics. Is there anyone in the room who hasn't used Google Analytics? Because we can save three minutes right there. There's one guy. I'll come and speak to you later. <laughs> save everyone else some time. Um, but the bottom line is you should be looking at this data if you're getting it every single day. I remember talking to a really large retailer who had an issue with uh, traffic from Google. 
Uh, we launched a new feature, and they were convinced that it was sending them less traffic. We asked them to look at their analytics data. Uh, and this is a multi-million dollar business, and they're like, we only look at our data once a month. We had it last week. We're not going to get it for another three weeks, but we feel our traffic's down. So the internet is the most measurable medium in the world bar none. You can absolutely, minute to minute, or at least day to day, understand what's working and what's not on your website. So to not take advantage of that is foolish at best. Um, another great product we have is uh, Website Optimizer. Now, we don't, we don't think we've designed the best web page, the best search engine result. We don't know what the best web page is for a user yet. Matt mentioned the internet's only 15 years old. You know, this stuff is still in its infancy. Bettina talked about using front page. I had the uh, misery of trying to take apart front page generated hands by hand and clean them up. It does nasty code. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and now you have people crafting HTML by hand. But the point is we don't know what the best design is. This is a page for Picasso. Um, it's one of our image, it's our image editing and uh, uploading tool. And this was the download page. And we had some uh, suppositions about this page. We thought it's always better to describe user benefits than product features. We thought links would receive more clicks than buttons. Uh, and uh, it presently mangled the text. Free offers are more desirable than trial offers. And if you have an attractive product, flaunt it. We were actually uh, completely wrong. But we wanted to test and see what would be better. So using Website Optimizer, you run a variation of the page to a subset of your users. Define a conversion, whatever that might be, downloading a white paper, downloading a product, signing up for a newsletter, selling something. And then we'll tell you which uh, version performed the best. In this case, we tried a bunch of different copy, links versus buttons with slightly different copy in it, and picture versus no picture. And what happened was this new page had an increase in 30% of downloads. Now, I don't care what you're doing. A 30% uplift in anything is significant. And that's through just changing three key points on the page. At Google, on our search results page, we try six or 700 different experiments every year of which we launch anything between two and 400, um, depending on what's successful and what's not. But we're never nervous to try out new stuff. And I encourage you guys to get stuck in there too. How can you do that easily? Well, it's easiest to start by being open. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of data in a bunch of our different products. If you use Gmail, then you know, we've got records of your emails, your chat transcripts if you choose to save those, and so on. Let's say you want to switch to another provider. Let's say actually you don't like the way threading in Gmail works. You want to go back to Hotmail. We want to make it possible for you to download the bulk of your content and take it to another provider. You shouldn't be locked in just because you happen to use our free service. And that's true of all types of data. Um, and in fact, we've got the data liberation front, which is a team internally who run around hitting product managers with sticks and making sure that their data can be downloaded. Um, but we also have Google Code. This is my favorite website, being a bit of a geek. But it's got over 80 different APIs and tools and platforms that you can use largely for free to build out your own website. I want to touch on a couple of these now. Um, we've got auth account authentication, AdSense API, AdWords API, AdSense for Ajax, Search Ads, Ajax APIs, Ajax Feed API, Ajax Language API, Ajax Search APIs, Analytics, Android, App Engine, Apps, App Marketplace, APIs and Tools, and that's just the A's. So there's an awful lot of stuff in there. And I recommend that whenever you're thinking about building new content for your site, go check out code.google.com. Go check out other API sites and see if someone hasn't done the work for you. A lot of the time, software developers are taught at university, don't reinvent the wheel. And so, as an engineer, as a developer, I don't want to be building another user registration system. I don't want to be building another mapping product. I want to take something that already works and worry about how I'm going to make a change that works for me or works for the site that I'm building. And we see other sites doing this too. Some of my demo, most of my examples are video game uh, centric. I apologize. But wow, World of Warcraft have an API that allows the users to build their own tools for in-game. I, got, I lost about a year and a half of my life to World of Warcraft. I'm off it now, I'm happy to say. But I built about three uh, add-ons for it for our guild at the time. And that's the thing about developers. You know, all of you will have passions. You might like football, you might like beer, you might like fine art. Um, and you'll spend some of your free time doing that. Developers like programming. That's why they do it. And if there's an API available for something they also like doing, they're going to tinker with it. And they're going to play, and they're going to create. And they're going to create stuff you didn't know about. But they're not going to be able to do this until you give them the opportunity. And that's why we open up so many of these platforms. Another one, Twitter. I'm sure uh, all of you, or not all of you, but those of you who are on Twitter don't necessarily use the native Twitter client for your phone. You might use TweetDeck. You might use uh, Android Tweet, I think, was around for a while. But there's a whole bunch of different services that perform different features on Twitter, depending on what the user wants. And developers have built these using the API. Um, Quake, was, Quake 2 was ported to HTML5. I'm uh, intrigued to see Quake 2 is always an interesting baseline because it's one of those things that was open sourced. And now it's put on everything from like phones to fridges to browsers. Um, and so again, just by opening up this code, you start to see interesting experimentation in the area. 
And it's not just video games. Uh, this is Cootie Man. I'm not going to show these demos just in the interests of time, but uh, grab the uh, presentation afterwards. I've got links to everything at the bottom. But Cootie Man was a mashup of YouTube videos. He took a bunch of different YouTube videos. Uh, he didn't pitch change them or anything and just started to make songs. And there's one, I think, uh, Someday, where there's just a woman sitting in her living room with a baby singing along, and he's put like you know an amazing soundtrack underneath. And I just had one of those moments that like this is actually an incredible thing. He's, this woman, when she first sang this song and uploaded it to YouTube, had about 50 views. And he dug it out, and now it's turned, you know, this video with her in it has now got a million and a half views. And it's a way of taking content that people upload almost speculatively, or just for their friends to see, and actually getting it out to a wider audience. But unless you make your content available, people aren't able to experiment with it easily. Last FM, of course, as well, by making their scrobbling service available, they've made uh, some really interesting applications available on the internet. Maps, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Uh, I imagine all of you have used Google Maps, so I won't bore you with the features and you know, the reasons it's awesome. But um, the first API that Google launched was the Google Maps API. And it came from uh, this website here, if I can type, housingmaps.com. Now, this is just a really simple mashup of Craigslist and the Google Maps uh, API. Well, in fact, at the time, it wasn't even the Google Maps API. What these guys did was hack Google Maps to be able to display it on their website and then overlay their data on top. Um, and you can choose a city, and it's mostly US-based. I'll go for London, but there's only over a few pins there. There we go, four pins. Um, and the red pin means that there's uh, no picture. The yellow pin means there's a picture. And you actually get to see these houses overlaid on a map, and it's quite a nice visual uh, presentation. Um, but once we saw this, we were like, well, we should make these maps available for everyone. And so we did. And we've seen some really interesting examples. You know, there's the banal ones, like the real estate uh, examples. There's, you know, store finders. There's using Street View to show real-world locations. But I think it starts to get a lot more interesting when... Um, I'm going to have to skip through this again, sorry. It starts to get a lot more interesting when you look at using Google Maps to actually generate images uh, or to explore images rather than map areas. So if I go to... Uh, New window, the Kramer collection. There we go. There's a guy who's uh, using the Google Maps um, engine to actually allow you to zoom into high res imagery, if I can catch it. Here we go. And I can click on this, and you'll recognize, if it loads, hopefully, on the top left, the Google Map controls that uh, you know and love. There we go. So I can drag this around just like I would with a map. I can double click, and it will zoom in. Uh, and actually, I can double click into the point where I can start to see some of the brush strokes. It's kind of a little bit greened out there. But, um, by using a simple tool written by a university, UCL, you're able to feed in an image and generate this HTML page in under 30 seconds. And you can do this with any image. Um, um, it, they did it with Grand Theft Auto as well. Um, Grand Theft Auto, fairly popular game, got uh, you know, a world that you can explore. So by using Google Maps to create markers and add videos in on the key points to show you how to get past a page, they're actually creating a virtual world in an interface that people understand. So don't be constrained by the simple product as it's made available. You know, let your imagination really run wild. Um, mobile also adds a whole new element. Ian's going to talk a lot more about that later. But just having location-based services on a, on a map um, that's in your pocket is incredible. If I'm searching for a coffee shop, if I'm searching for a cinema, if I'm searching for a gig, whatever it might be, if I go onto my phone and search for it, I want to know about the place near me. I don't care about somewhere the other side of London because that's not where I am. So when people come to your website, use that simple bit of code. It's a couple of lines of JavaScript to sniff where the user is and start to feed them targeted information. It's not difficult, and it can make the difference between someone bouncing off your site and actually staying on and bookmarking it and coming back again and again. Now, how do you experiment with this stuff? Well, cloud computing is a nice way. Some of you may have heard of Amazon S3, Microsoft Azure. We also have Google App Engine. But what it means is um, you're able to scale your uh, demand. You're able to not have to worry about provisioning servers. Um, in order to uh, deliver content. And it's a lot cheaper than having to you know, go through the business case of we need this computer and we need to host it here and we need this much bandwidth and predict the number of users. Let me show you an example. Obama, just before he was elected, ran a town hall Q&A. He allowed people to submit questions uh, in advance on Google Moderator, which sits on Google App Engine. Now, Google Moderator is just a crowdsourced question and answer system. People ask questions, other people vote them up and down. You run it a few days before an event, and hopefully by the time the event comes around, you've got the questions ordered by level of importance according to everyone who's going to be attending. Traditionally, uh, if this was the traffic spike, uh, the really high one is actually the deadline for submission. The one at the beginning is when they first announced it, and there's other spikes where the blogosphere picked it up and CNN did some coverage. In a traditional model, uh, everywhere that this red line 
didn't hit the blue line, you'd be wasting money on hosting because you'd have to provision the number of servers to deal with that many queries a second, to deal with that many database queries, to deal with you know, serving that much traffic. You've got electricity, you've got bandwidth, you've got the cost of actually putting the thing in a data center. With App Engine, you remove those costs, and with any cloud service, because you're only paying for what you use. App Engine's slightly different in that you don't have virtual machines to manage, you just write some software and run it. And we'll scale it up and down as you need. And we'll give you about five million page views a month for free. That's before you have to start paying. And if you can't work out how to make some money off five million page views a month, then chances are that idea's rubbish. Move on to the next one. It's okay, it hasn't cost you anything except a bit of development time. That's the beauty of it. Allow your developers to play around. They can write in Java or Python, um, and within about half a day, uh, you can get a handle on how to build code. Um, there's a great website called Seven Books, which has just launched, which is trying to do for book reading what uh, Last FM did for music. It aggregates uh, your reading lists and tries to scrubble them together and then show uh, results or books that you might like based on other people's use, uh, reading lists. The guy who wrote it put it together in a month and wasn't a programmer before he started. It took him two weeks uh, to get the initial Hello World example, that's the very basic example for any computer program working, and another two weeks to actually build and deploy the website. Um, he's now got a few thousand users a day, and he's written a really interesting blog post. I only saw it this afternoon, so I didn't get time to get it into the deck, but have a search for seven books and read his story if that's interesting to you. The final thing I want to show is HTML5. Um, we've built, uh, there are a couple of demos, so again, download uh, this deck, have a look at these demos. Probably most of you have seen The Wilderness Downtown, if you haven't, check it out. Uh, and the other one is uh, Sports Illustrated. There's a link at the bottom, but it's an idea of how you might use HTML5 to bring uh, rich media and uh, kind of magazines to the internet um, in a nice reading format. But we also, if you want to get started with HTML5, and you do, trust me, uh, we've got a website called html5rocks.com. I know it's a stupid name, but our developers came up with it. Um, but there we've got a bunch of interactive presentations, a bunch of information on how you can use HTML5. What is HTML5? I've just realized I haven't told you. Um, it's so, traditionally, Flash uh, was the way to make interactive web pages. Back when HTML was first created, HTML is hypertext markup language. It's what you use to make a web page look like a web page. You, you can bold text, you can create tables, you can put images in. But to get sort of games, to get things moving, to get animations was really, really hard. So a bunch of plugins appeared and Flash rapidly became the most popular. The problem with Flash, if it can be called a problem, is that it's maintained by a company who have to build updates and have to make sure they're building Flash updates for every platform. And of course, Jobs has kicked off and said that he doesn't want Flash on most of the Apple products now. HTML5 tries to bring HTML, which used to just basically italicize text and kind of put line breaks in, up to the modern age. And it allows you to do some really, really rich and cool things. If we go to the YouTube homepage today, in my last minute, um, we will see that this uh, is an advertisement showing that the Beatles content is now available on iTunes for the first time. And the whole thing's in HTML5. This isn't a Flash movie playing. It's just normal web content. And the great thing about that is, traditionally search engines have a hard time understanding Flash. So by using HTML5, you can make sure that we can understand the content on your pages and deliver great results to users. Um, if you only remember one thing from this presentation, I hope that it's code.google.com. I don't see any of you writing down, so hopefully you've all got great <laughs> memories. Um, but go check that out, or at least point your developers in that direction, because chances are there's a bunch of tools that they'll uh, find and use, find helpful. Thank you. <laughs>